right. I think I'll just go ahead and get started here. Yeah, no. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, because I'm I probably am going to finish up about 5.30. That's, it shouldn't be. Okay. This, this presentation is probably not as long as the others. Okay. Um, okay. Mark, can you see this? Yes, indeed. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to pick up where I left off last time. Um, last time we were talking about uh, we, we made the, the uh, move over to sequential logic from combinational logic. And I said that basically there's a lot of issues with that. Um, and uh, that's, that, that, that's universal across the, uh, across the board. You know, I've, I've spoken with many instructors and, and professors about this topic. And it uh, doesn't matter if it's, you know, a community college or MIT. You know, it just, it just loses the students. Um, and I don't, I don't know exactly the way. I've, I've tried to kind of make that turn, you know, gentle, but, um, you know, with, without uh, losing content. But it's, uh, it's, it's a tough one. All right, um, so I uh, just want to go through this. I'm going to talk about, summarize a little bit of the latches, talk about flip-flops, clocking, uh, a little, some analysis of flip-flop circuits where I think that some of the students um, have a really hard time kind of seeing the, um, how the flops work. And I'll, I'll highlight some of those issues that you know, problems they have. Uh, timing diagrams are thrown in there, asynchronous input, and I've got some examples of problems that are in here that are pretty illustrative of the kind of things that I think that students uh, need to see and be able to analyze. Um, last time we were talking about the latches, and this is just a review, so just a nice review sheet of the, of the primary latches that are used. And SR latch, of course, is just set reset. Um, basically, if the signal's high, uh, the reset's high, it'll set the, key, the state to zero. If it sets high one, again, it has an undefined state at one, one. S prime R prime, the inverted SR latch, um, is significant. I try to tell the students because because it sets the output when the signal goes low. This is this is something that um, I try to drive home with these students because um, there's a lot of signals that are that are are driven low to to cause some sort of change in the output. It's not always one doesn't always mean do something. Sometimes you know many of the well many of the enables are low are uh, Inverted signals, and we'll talk about the asynchronous inputs and inverted signals as well. That's always to save power, usually. Uh, clock SR latch. Here we start bringing in the clock. The first two, of course, are asynchronous, but the, uh, this third one is, is synchronized with the clock. Therefore, the clock is low. Nothing's happening. The state doesn't change. Q star is Q. And then when it kicks in, it looks gives the same uh, profile as the SR latch. So that's why it's the clock SR, even though the second stage of that is the prime R prime. So, um, this is just a summary here. And we basically said that for these three architectures, they all suffer from the main, the main issues. You can see here, they all, they all have undefined states. You know, so that's the presence of undefined states you know, causes the latch to be stable and unpredictable. The last thing you want is something that's bouncing around. Um, the, the quick uh, remedy to this was to put an inverter between the S and R such that it prevents those two from being the same. And thus we have a clock D latch, which only has one input. And that's, what, that's what's here. Okay, so the D is basically the S signal. You got an inverter going in where the R was. And now it prevents everything. If the clock is low, the state doesn't change. And if the clock is high, Q, the next state of Q just follows D. And that's, so that's, that's, the, that's the solution there. The, um, the problem is, in number two here, it says because the next state of the system follows D, which is simple, it's a poor design due to the fact that whatever D does, this will change the, entire, the state of the entire system. Uh, that may not be desirable, especially if you have some kind of noise issues. And if D is kind of jittery, then you're just going to keep reflecting that um, on in the changing the system. So the way around this, um, well, here's this. This is illustrative of this. So if, if I have this D signal, this is a plot from last time. Um, now I've got some noise indicated by these little arrows here. Um, that you know, if if the, if the clock is high. And Q just ends up getting the exact same thing transferred over to it. Okay, this is called transparency, and um, this is something you actually try to avoid. You, you want to have some sort of a barrier or some sort of an architecture that prevents the output from seeing a direct line of sight into the input. So, uh, do this fix this? We do flip flops. Okay, so the idea about the flip flops <laughs> are the to uh, get rid of use a two stage system. Historically, this has been called a master-slave configuration, and there's a lot of equipment, actually, in, in manufacturing that uses the master-slave configuration. This, of course, is not politically correct in the slightest. 
So some people have recommended sure. Yeah, so some people have have uh, recommended use the word uh, recorder reporter. Okay, I, I think that's not that's actually kind of hard to remember, but I'm sure there's probably better ways there are things for people to think of. But the concept is all the same. And that's that the signal comes in, and uh, the salient feature is the fact that you've got an inverted clock going into the second stage. So when the clock is high, um, you have a direct line of sight between the, to import, the, uh, the state of the first clock SR, which is P, it sees D. But since the clock is pulled low in the second stage, it's blocked. The, the line between P and Q is blocked. Okay, so Q doesn't have direct line of sight to D. Then when it flips over to the negative side, then P goes to Q, you know, and then D, D can't as a line of sight to P. So this is a two-stage system. It's just kind of a, uh, you know, kind of it's kind of a load release, load release, load release kind of thing. And it's, um, it works. You know, it, this this is the basis of most um, uh, most flops. Okay. So this this is the the master recorder section, and this is the slave of the recorder region. Okay. And and so let's take a look. This is um, students to get the students a real idea about how this works. I run this particular, I usually draw this on the board, but uh, I run this particular simulation. I, I show them exactly how this works. So, so keep in mind, P was this intermediate state. It goes through the first flip-flop. And so what, you, what I do is I first kind of just look at what, what's going on with P for the clock signal. So if I look at the output of P, P is going to follow along until it, the clock hits. When the clock hits, it's going to follow D. Okay? Now this right here, through my arrow here, this right here is a tricky part that all students have. I'll bring this up a couple of times in this talk. And that is that very often when the clock turns off, a lot of students will make a lot of students will just say, okay, the signal goes back down. And that's not true. You gotta keep in mind that when the that the state says that when the clock is off, that it doesn't change state. You know, so Q star equals Q. That's what this is. You know, the last thing it knew you know, before the clock went low, was that, you know, P was equal to D. And when it shut off, then it just holds that until the next positive, positive sign, the positive pulse. Then, then it, once it hits there, it follows D for the entire pulse. So it picks up this noise right here. When the clock shuts down, it holds that last value until it won't, it won't see that, it won't see D bounce up here, not until this clock hits. Then it pops up and it does, faithfully reproduces D here. Then, uh, then it pops up here, the, shuts, the, the uh, clock shuts off, and it holds that state until the next pulse. Then it holds it here, and then it reproduces this piece. Uh, the clock turns off when D is low, so it holds low until the next edge, and then it on out. So this is something that the students, uh, students routinely have problems with, that if, if the clock turns off, they, they don't hold that state, which is kind of the whole concept of a flip-flop. You know, it's, it's, it's to hold that signal until Someone comes along and tells you not to. Okay, so now, going back to you know the way that the flip flop works, I've got this intermediate state P, and then that through the second flop, which is going to be on the, on the low pulse. You know, once it's on the low pulse, then it's going to um, <coughs> transfer that information to Q. Okay, so so here's Q, and now Q is, doesn't do anything until the low pulse comes through, and then it follows. P. Okay, as soon as the low pulse turns off here, it takes the latest value that it had of P and it holds it. So it goes right through. It doesn't, does not, doesn't see this noise at all. Then when it goes low again, it follows P. Uh, it shuts off. Uh, P was low. Uh, right on the edge. Right on the edge here, it takes before, before the clock hits. So it's low. So it holds. Then uh, follows P again. You know, again, because the, the pulse shut off, it doesn't see doesn't it doesn't see the um, noise and then it plays out. So what you have here is something that's actually pretty important, which is that we don't see any of this first noise on the D line change change the system state Q. Okay, so this prevents the transparency. So we had two two big problems that were solved by using the latch systems. The first one said that uh, the first one we inverted the inputs and got rid of the they could be the same state, that got rid of, rid of the undefined state. Then we use a two-stage system uh, to do the flip-flops. Um, and that this is a good exercise for students. They, when, they, when they kind of work through this, it kind of shows them exactly 
why this doesn't happen and why this works, which is good. All right. So basically here is if you actually remove, if you actually remove the, um, the intermediate state P together, then you can actually see really what's going on. You can see, for instance, that when the, when the clock goes low, Q grabs the value of D and holds it until the clock goes low again. Then it holds, grabs the value of D, holds that until the clock goes low again. Then it grabs it here. Same thing, clock goes low and it grabs that value and holds it. This is an edge trigger. Okay, so this is how you create uh, an edge trigger device. Okay, so every every downward edge of the clock pulse, it's all of the output just grabs the value of D and just holds that until the next downward edge of the clock pulse. This is the um, this is usually most most uh, flops are done on edge triggers. It could be high edge or low edge, but this is this is the idea. Um, some students have a little bit of a hard time with this. Um, in general, they seem to seem to grasp it pretty well, um, but they sometimes just grab the wrong edge or whatever. Um, these D flops, this configuration, I, I just noted down here that the D flops really are the basis for those random architectures. Um, the JK flops, the T flops, which we'll talk about next. Um, our, our JK is very is very multi useful and T is used for counters. So um, that's kind of the way that goes. We'll talk about counters on Tuesday. All right. Oh yeah, I forgot I had some things here. Yeah. So the negative edge. So, so on each on these downward edges, it reads it reads this signal. Okay. And so this is uh, this is you know what's come about using this two stage system. Okay. So uh, the next flop that we talk about is the JK. Um, so this is what the JK looks like. It's basically nothing more than a, a slightly more complicated version of the D flop with, with some extra glue logic put on there. Um, I usually just give them this. I don't really go through the details of the operation. You know, have them go through the, the, uh, the AND gates and everything. Um, certainly, this you know, one could do that if we wanted to. Um, but again, we have the exact same situation. The clock is inverted to the second stage. We have a, the two-stage uh, clock SR. So it's the master-slave configuration, uh, the interme intermediate state P. So, so it's the same basic configuration, just a little bit of uh, configuring the input a little differently. Um, so, so basically, the uh, J and K, uh, some people use the mnemonics for jump and K, J for jump and K for clear. They didn't, I guess they didn't want to use set and reset. But this is the basic state table for what you end up having. So, so basically, they're both zero. You've got an unchanged state. It's Q starting with Q. Uh, when the uh, K goes high, it clears. When, when J is high, it sets. And if they both are high, it toggles. Okay, so this is a different configuration. And before, before, you know, this was an unstable state. Here, uh, the toggle. Students get confused about the word toggling. Um, and it's a concept that you sometimes, they sometimes will think toggle means, you know, it goes to one. Or but, it, but basically, it just means if it's at zero, it goes to one. If it's one, it goes to zero. That's it. It just flips its state. You know, the beauty of binary. Well, it's only got two choices. So, you know, that, that's the deal. Um, so, um, I do have to work with them you know, a little bit on trying to get them to, um, to understand exactly what's going on there. Um, so, there's a couple things from the JK state table that are important to notice, and that, which makes this a very flexible flop, which is I try to tell. Because usually, what the um, when we're building uh, circuits in the lab, they'll say, "Oh, I need a T flop," and I'll be like, "Well, what are you going to do?" Because you know, you only have a JK flop. He says, "Well, you know, you have to figure out to make one." Okay. Well, hold on a second. Um, here we go. All right. So, for instance, if you, the JK are tied together, you know, so that so they can't be opposite. The first thing you see right now is that if, if they're both zero, the state stays the same. If they're both one. Uh, it inverts. Okay, so this becomes a toggle flop. The much more simplified diagram is over here. If the toggle input is zero, it stays the same state. If it's one, it flop. It uh, toggles. Okay, so so basically all you have to do is tie the two inputs together, and you make a toggle flip, flip flop. That's great. Same. Likewise, if you just if you put an inverter between them, then what you see is that Q star basically follows J. If we just if we just basically just like we did when making the clock uh, or the uh, gated D latch, we put an inverter between the two inputs, we make a D flop. That's what we have here. You know, Q star follows J, so we just redefine J to be D, and, and there you have it. So this is why uh, the JK flop is, is uh, 
it's very flexible and that's why it's universally used in circuits because we can configure it to do whatever we want. So we can make a nice counter circuit by, by configuring it as a toggle flop. We can make a really nice memory component if we want to toggle it as a flop. Okay. Um, so far so good? Okay, from here. Okay. Yes. All right. yes, indeed. Thank you. Okay, good. No problem. Yeah, the... Um, Okay, so this is a this is a, a this is a very difficult problem. Okay, it's, it's not too difficult, but think about it like anything else. There's a lot of book. <laughs> so I'm going to go through this problem. It's it's a very good thing to go through with students. I give them a lot of exercise like this, and I'll show you some of those problems later on. Um, one of the main things is that the um, um, one thing is that there's a couple of things to look at here. The, main, the most important thing is that nothing can happen to the flip-flop. I don't show the clock on this, but these guys are clocked at the same time. Okay, so these are two separate flops. This, this isn't two stages of a flop. Okay, so I got a D-flop and a T-flop. Okay, so the, the key here is that when you can load up the value on the lines, but nothing happens until the clock pulse goes. The clock pulse is indicated by this thick line on the, the chart. So so basically, the, the, this kind of situation, I say, okay, there's a data stream coming in. X is one zero one one zero. Okay, I say I give them initially that the flops are cleared. Okay, we'll talk and we we'll talk about that a little bit later. So there's the, the initial state of the system is zero zero. Okay, that's the, that's the state of the system. Then you have to go through and figure out what is sitting on the input lines for D and T. Then when the clock hits, that tells us what's going to happen to the outputs. The first thing we look at is, well, if you look at it, if you look at the, the, that AND gate, there's X is going into it, but so is the output. Okay, the Q of B, I just call B, okay? So the output of the first stage, the B pop is A, and the output of the second one is B. That's a zero, so that's, that's going to set a zero going into the input for the first flop. If you look at the input to the second flop, it's tied to Q prime. That's going to be a one, okay? So this guy has a one. All right, so that tells me basically what's in there. Now, before I hit the clock pulse, all this is you know, nice and stable. So now I hit the clock, I know exactly what it is. The D-flop, the output of a D-flop is just the input state. So that's, that's going to automatically set that to zero. The output of a T-flop is going to toggle. If it's a one, if it's a zero, it keeps the same state. Okay, so there you go. If it's a one, that means the output goes to one. Okay, so that gives me new states, zero and one. Okay, so that's my new state. Now, if I want to calculate why, I just go, you know, I go down there and I look at the gates. You know, I, well, I've got a 0 and a 1 going into the XOR. That gives me a 1. I've got a 1, 1 going in the end gate. That gives me a 1. Y is 1. Okay. And then, now I'm ready for the next piece of data. But the key here is that now, that, that state is now, that, that next state is now my current state. Okay. So now that's... That's, that's the current state. Now x changes to zero. Then I changed, I changed everything, and now I have a zero of one. That's my state. So I go through it again. Well, I've got, a, I've got. A, if you look at what's in the input, the AND gate. I've got a zero and a one. That's going to give me a zero. And t is going to be from q prime, so that's going to give me a one there. Okay, so my output is going to be a zero for a, and then it's going to toggle again, so it's going to be set to zero. And this is a, this is a point of confusion for students. When they see that one on the toggle, they'll set it to one. They won't toggle it back to zero. That's a very common mistake that I find students. So now my, my next state is zero, zero. Um, there's a zero that goes right directly to the zero for the and, so y automatically has to be zero. Okay, now I have, you know, now zero, zero becomes my next state. Okay, I'm ready to go again. So what, you know, so this process of, of going through this with students is very, very valuable because this lets them see um, exactly how the flops work. You know, they can't do anything until that clock hits. And we see that exactly in the lab, too, because you know, basically the clocks are going to be done manually, at least you know, for the first, the first portion of it. You know, we'll run some counters you know, through, clock, through actual clocks, but, but they're basically just using a, you know, just a little switch to, to simulate the clock themselves. And so they can see, they can step through this themselves. They can build this and they can step through these states. All right, so just going through this, I'm going to go through this one, this one chart. I, I have other, I'm, I'm, I'll skip around some other ones, but 
But here, zero, zero, I've got uh, B is zero, one, zero, so I have another zero coming into A. I've got another one going into the B. Therefore, it's going to set to zero. The B is going to toggle again. My output is zero, one. Uh, I've got a zero, one going, and I've got an, another one. Now, this is actually pretty important here because if you look, this just as a point of sanity, I actually had the exact same state here. So I should have cut the next, the absolute next state should be exactly the same. That's always, so when you see that, as a shortcut, students will realize that they actually don't have to work that out. They just write it down. There's fair. Okay, so now I've got a new state, 101. This is actually one we haven't seen yet. Okay, so now I've got a 1, 1 going into the end gate. So that puts a 1 here. I've got another toggle here. So now the 1's going to set to 1. The 1's going to make this toggle to 0. So I'm going to get a 1, 0 coming out. Uh, that's my next state. 0 is going to make Y 0 instantly. So I got 1, 0 here. This is another state we haven't seen. Set this up for the last run. Okay, then um, I've got a 0 going in the end gate, so that's a 0. This is a 1, so this makes the toggle this has a 0 here. That means it's going to keep the same state. Um, I'm not sure what the 0 is from, but this one's over. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, this zero is from here. Okay, so zero goes through zero here, and then this zero is so my last state zero zero, and then y is zero. And this is it. Okay, so this this kind of a going through this process is really valuable because you know it really shows them exactly how the flops work, and they have to be very you know very pedantic, you know, kind of a, you know, in, in their method for doing this. It's a fair amount of bookkeeping. It's kind of nice to have the you know on this presentation because you know I can make all the things disappear but you know students are erasing stuff and putting ones and writing stuff out it's a, it's a big mess but it's a very good exercise and um, it really teaches them one how the d-flops work how the t-flops work um, they can you know a couple of gates and they kind of get the idea all right um, one thing that students have a difficult under, uh, understanding is, are the four clock types okay so you have uh, four clocking types that you can have for flip-flops. It can be high level, low level, a rising edge, or a falling edge. Uh, I like to give them the exact same clock and data stream for each of those four conditions. Okay, so, um, so I'll just I'll work through that here. Uh, again, I, you know, this is all recorded, and if anybody, of course, needs any of these slides, you know, I, I, I'm happy to send them to you. Um, but so this is a this is a good exercise that really helps the students understand it. So for, if we follow, if I kind of go through this first for the for the for the level triggers, which you see here. Okay, here we are. So the first thing is it's Q. So Q is not going to do anything until the clock is high. So while what what a high level trigger means is that that when the clock is high, it completely does whatever D does. This is the whole concept of transparency, something that you don't want. This is exactly what this thing does, which we've been trying to not do. Okay, so here it's going to follow, whoops, it's going to follow D, and again, uh, let's see, okay, so I didn't point this out on that, but so again, one of the issues is that when the clock goes low, it keeps that same state. Uh, that, that's very important. Until the next, until the clock is high again, then it follows D, and it holds that until the next pulse, and then it follows this piece, because this is in a high level, um, follows this, this all the way through, okay, until it, so it follows Follows this part of D going through there, and then finally it holds that last piece low until the clock kicks in again. Follows that piece out. Okay, so basically the idea there is it just follows exactly what D does during the clock pulse. When the clock sh shuts off, it holds that last value D until the next clock pulse. That's the whole idea. If we uh, look at the inverse of this, and look at what happens when we, we use we, we we're going to Use the clock on the, uh, the negative pulse. Well, in that case, where it's, the clock is going to kick in here, we're going to have just a little bit. So, so it's zero until it pops the clock. The pulse clocks in. Then we're going to get this little piece here, All right? And then, then that's going to then it's going to hold that uh, until the next pulse. And that, the, the entire pulse here, it's negative, so it's all negative through there. And then it kicks up here, so it holds it. This, and then when the clock shuts off. It holds that until the next little piece, then it kind of follows this little, this little piece of D here, and then, then finally get that last part down. So the important thing we'll see for all four of these clocking configurations is that they all give different states or state configurations. So that, that's very important. That's important to realize that. Uh, looking at the edges, 
you know, also, also one thing to note, going, going back to this previous, you know, you'll see that anytime you're using level triggers, you have some small kind of, kind of pieces that are in it where you, you get the signals, you know, kind of go down and come back up fast. So it has a little more jitter in it, so to speak, or at least a little bit, a little bit more, um, uh, uh, I don't know what, by stability, I guess. Right. The, um, so the next one is with the edge. So here, so here all we're going to do is with the downward edge, we go until we hit the downward edge of the clock, we take that value of D and we hold it till the next downward edge of the clock. Very simple. I deserve. Uh, I, I always sometimes, I'm a little puzzled when students have a hard time with this because it really becomes very simple. Here's the downward edge, D is a zero, it goes down. The next downward edge is here, D is high, it goes high. Next downward edge, edge D is zero, it goes zero, and then the next downward edge, D is zero, so it holds that out. Notice that the edge triggers, you know, what one of the salient features of the uh, edge triggers, that there is not j a lot of jitter. So, so that's, um, yeah, so that's that. Um, positive edge, same situation, except you're just going to grab the value of D on the positive edge. Here you see D is 1, so we're going to grab that. Here D is 0, it's going to go back down. On this positive edge, D is still 0, so it holds until the next one up. And then it's high again, it holds all the way out. Again, we have two very different uh, uh, waveforms for this system state, depending on which one. And they, of course, don't look anything like the other, the others. So you see for each of these clocking schemes, we get four different state configurations. Okay, so, and all, so for flip-flop circuits, we basically say that the next state of the system depends on the inputs to the system, the current state of the system, now, we said that initially, we just talked about sequential logic, how that feeds back into it. Um, then we talked about the, um, uh, then we just now brought in the clocking scheme. That's also very important. Okay, so the last thing to bring in is one more thing, and that is the asynchronism. Okay, so now that we've got every, now we have, um, you know, we know that the current state, you know, what, whatever goes next to it depends on the state of the inputs and the clocking. We may have now have inputs that just bypass the entire system and just disrupt everything. And those are the asynchronous inputs. All right. So um, all flip-flop ICs include the ability to either uh, manually set it or through some sort of overriding circuit to set the state to one or reset it to zero. Okay. These are done through preset and clear inputs. They're usually inverted. And, um, but we'll, we'll see that in a bit. Um, because these are asynchronous, they override the clock. Okay, so whatever happens, uh, it, it, the output will respond to those signals independent of the clock. Okay, and then for when, when those signals are active, it won't see the clock, it won't see the inputs to the system. Uh, these are typically active low um, for various power reasons. Okay, so if you look at the kind of, kind of truth table or state table for the preset and clear, typically they're held at one. Okay, if they're held at one, um, it's, um, there's, a clock op there's a clock operation. Okay. Um, basically means that it just goes through a normal sequence of events. You know, as long as those guys are held high, it's perfectly fine. Right. When preset goes low, okay, then it's going to set the output to one. Okay. And this is an important thing because sometimes you know, you can imagine that if you want to store some data in memory, okay, memory is going to be a whole bunch of flip-flops. So you, you say, okay, I want to store this 101101, whatever it is, I want to put that in memory, it has to write that into memory. It's got to go, in the way it writes that into memory, it's doing something like this. It goes through and it sets presets some, it clears some other, and it stores that data in there, and then it, then it, 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 um, then it, well, it stores that, and then it shuts off those values and it goes through normal operation. If the clear is pulled low, it will clear it. And then if they're both pulled low, it says it's not used. Okay, so basically that's an unstable state. Um, and so that's just basically not done. What it does is it jitters. Okay, so if you, if you, you know, obviously one of them only, only needs to be, you know, a gate delay of 20 nanoseconds faster than the other one to figure out exactly what's going to happen. But usually there's jitter. It kind of bounces between a couple of states. All right, so this is and this is the um, the chip 7476, which is one of the JK flops. You can see that each flop has preset and clear. 
uh, in addition to uh, JK three two output in the clock, and of course power ground from the ship. So this is um, so this is this is uh, you know the kind of situation that you have. All right, I want to talk a little bit about each of these because uh, this is this is helpful to the students to go through and um, to take these kind of on one by one so they get a real sense of what's going on. So. Here I've got a clock and another data stream coming in. And I've got a preset, which is mostly high except for this long piece. So I'm assuming that Q is a downward edge trigger. Okay, so if that's usually the case. Every time the clock goes low, um, it would grab the value of D and just hold it to the next lower edge. Okay, so here it's going to go through, but all of a sudden it hits the low preset. So the preset is going to block everything from the data and from the clock to, to the output. So all of a sudden preset is get there. And I here I am goes high. Now, here's the situation here. Okay, when the pre this is something that problems have. I wrote this up in red as well. When the preset shuts off, the state does not go back to where it was before. Okay, when it shuts off, it puts it back in, like that truth table says, it's 1-1. One, one. It just says it keeps the last state until the next clock goes. Okay, so the next, uh, so this is, a, this is a big problem that students have. Um, I see this all the time. When the preset or the clear shuts off, all of a sudden they'll be like, oh, and it goes back to where it was before. No, it doesn't. Because it can't, because as soon as it shuts off, it can't do anything until it goes to the next clock pulse. The next clock pulse is right here. Like that's the next edge. Okay, so once it sees that, then it looks at D. Now it's using normal operation, looks at D, D is high, therefore it stays high until it gets to the next edge. Then it's going to go low, and then it's, so then it's going to be low for, for here, and it's going to be low for there. Then it's normal operation. This is a, um, this, what I've indicated here this, with this oval is, this, this is a real problem, and students do this a lot. When, when, whenever the asynchronous input shut off, they tend to make this, the input go immediately back to where it was before it ever saw them, and that's not true. You've got to keep in mind that, you know, everything has to be synchronized with the clock unless it's during this asynchronous uh, input. Uh, similarly for clear, we have the same data input, but let's look at clear. Okay, so and, and just to be, just for practice, I'm going to take this on the positive edge instead of the negative edge. Okay, so we put on the positive edge. Here goes the signal. Um, it's going to jump up once it sees the when, once it hits the clock. It's going to grab that first. Oops, here we are. Uh, actually, that is misaligned. Misaligned with me. That's removed over with the clock. Okay, I'll fix that later. Okay, but once that first clock pulse hits, it grabs D. Then when the clear hits, it, it, it clears out. And again, we have the same issue here. When the clear shuts off, it doesn't bounce back up to where it was before. It keeps that low value until the next level. Well, that next level, well, actually, the next level is right here. But it's hard to tell. But it, so it's going to take a zero here. But then it's going to get the next rising level here, which is also low. And then, then the next one here, which is going high. I'm sorry, it catches it here. Okay, D is high here, so it grabs that and it holds that all the way out. So the same kind of situation that you have um, as before the pre, and this is this is just kind of an example that I, I like to run with the students so they get a really good feeling for for uh, how these things work. Um, and like I've indicated here, the problem is when they shut off the signal. Okay. Um, so uh, anything questions about this so far? Nope, still good on this end. Okay. It's it's a lot of content, but yeah, no. It's a lot of content. It's it it's it's deep. it's deep. Yeah, this is these are the kind of, because it's these are, you know, a couple weeks worth of lectures. Right. Basically going through it. And I one of the things I do with my students a lot, I don't <clears throat> and I think this is pretty important. Um I get the students up on the board working problems, you know, in groups. So I'll just give them a problem like this. I'll, I'll, I'll draw a waveform diagram, a couple of things. I'll tell them, or just draw a circuit and have them draw the waveforms. And, um, you know, work in groups of two or three up on the board and just have them do it. And that, that may be an entire class. Um, you know, that may, maybe just, sure. just one, one class of just working problems. Um, because, you know, this stuff is, uh, it, it's quite difficult. I mean, you know, and, and I've done enough of it to where, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it makes sense to me, but that doesn't always translate. So, um, really, is you just need to get them as much hands-on working with this as possible. Um, going sure. through these kind of questions. Yeah, I, it's very difficult because one of the things I wish I could do is 
a lot, I'll put up a lot of materials online, a lot of tutorials, a lot of practice problems. And um, you know, I, can't, I can't make them do them. You know, I mean, I can just say those are, those are there for you, you know, to use. And I think you should work these problems out before the next test or whatever it is. And, uh, and there's sometimes on Blackboard, I don't know if you've ever done this, but you can track, you can track statistics to see uh, how many students, and even I think which students, have opened up those documents. You know that you put online. Sure. You, you can find out that you, know, you have 25 students in the class. You'll find out four of them opened up the practice problems. Mm -hmm. You know, and I see this all the time. So it's it's you know, but I still provide it and I still tell them it's there and I I tell them, you know, I give them a, a list of every time we come to a test, I tell them, okay, here's my recommendations for how to study. I always say work through the examples in class, you work through your homework problems, work through some quiz problems, but but I always put up lots of example problems for them to work and and I'm. You know, I mean, everybody's got, uh, doesn't have, you know, this is not, probably not the only class they're taking, so they can't give an extra amount of time to it. I, I realize that, but um, I am somewhat stunned how you know, some, of the, some of the students don't take advantage of that. But, I'm yeah, curious what kind, of, what kind of success rate you have with the class? For, uh, for students going through this, this class. Oh, you know, actually, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's, uh, at Cincy State, we will lose 50% of a class. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, that's not always because of the content. It's just there's a, sure. lot, of, there's a lot of reasons for that. For that sure. Thing. Yeah. No, it's not, just, it's not just content. Some of it's, some of it's misalignment. They, uh, students get in, they think they were getting, they, they, they thought something different than, than what they're getting. And, yeah. you know, a lot, of it's, a lot of it's that. I mean, that's true. Hopefully... Yeah, it, part of it. Part of it becomes, hopefully, the students get some information. I mean, in some ways, I feel like my my high school class. That's what I'm doing. I'm 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 saying, if you really like, if you want to get into electrical engineering, this is one of the ways you do it. You know, this, these are the kinds of things that you'll be you'll be faced with um, if you're. Eh, I mean, because because a lot of this is really kind of. Kind of deep electrical engineering. Oh yeah. I think. I think. I, I. I'm. It's not my background, so I'm. I'm. But I'm trying to correlate. Is yeah. that true? Is um, that, I mean, where else would you use? Where, where else does this really go? Okay, software engineering, computer engineering. Yes, software engineering, um, computer engineering, um, biomedical. Um, okay. Biomedical. They go goes into that. Um, uh, there's a good uh, controls. Uh, mm -hmm. control. So there's there's it's there's a number of, of areas. Obviously, it's centered mm -hmm. around you know, computer engineering and, and also trying to fix a, trying to fix or repair computer systems. But the uh, yeah, it is now. Um, what is interesting though, I think the situation with your situation is a little bit different because um, I think you have uh, you know your your students are they're they're kind of. I don't want to say they would be kind of stuck in there, but but to some extent they just can't drop it. You know? Yes. Yeah, yeah so, that's right. So so they're they're kind of a captured audience to some extent. Um, for so, good and bad. <laughs> yeah, for good and bad, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, it's, a, it's a double edged sword, no doubt. Uh, but you know, so, so, so you only you only keep beating on them so much. Um, that's right. Yeah, but so but here, yeah, it is. Uh, it, the attrition rate is it's an issue. Um, the like I said, sometimes it's people just they get it's a, it just goes way over their head. And they can't mm -hmm. deal with it. But a lot of times, since it's community college, you've got family issues and all. And, you know, there's there's a, there's a lot of things, uh, you know, that are, that are going on that have nothing to do with class at all. So, but yeah, that does happen. Now, the um, if the students do really put the effort into it, mm -hmm. um, the student that you know, if if if, if they I can really get them coming to office hours, you know, helping them out. All, all that kind of stuff. They usually do pretty well. I mean, sure. they'll, they'll make it through the class. Uh, the ones who fail the class typically, they stop coming to lab. They they didn't turn in homework anymore. You know, stuff like that. You know, they just sure they give up. They they give up on the class. Yeah, and they I mean, give up on the class, and they've got maybe mm -hmm. maybe they've taken three other classes, and they're just going to concentrate on those, and maybe do this one next term or something. You know, and I can't. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, Ralph. Uh, quite quite honestly, a lot of the stuff that as you're going through it, I'm thinking, okay, I, I don't know how to do it. I'd have to go back and. And really review this stuff and get get through okay. it again. Oh, and okay. you know, I, I've been I've been in robotics 16 years. Sure. Um, 
you know, this is this is stuff I've 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 not touched. Oh yeah. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, it's a matter. Of, okay, well, hmm. Uh, yeah, there's there's some some good stuff here, but really, it's one of those things you have to you, you teach your kids to if if this is something they're after, mm-hmm. have have some grit, figure it out, work mm-hmm. like crazy. It is. It's it's. You know, um, it's, yeah. it's, so I, it's I, all I, out. I, I, I do tell the students that this probably is the hardest class that they'll take, you know, because it just, it requires, because if most students, somewhere or another, they've come up with the concept of voltage and current and mm-hmm. something like that. They've seen this somewhere, but they've never seen, you know, digital electronics unless they're some mm-hmm. crazy hobbyists. You know, so um, it just, it just doesn't come up. So it's a very, very different uh, course. And um, like I said, some, some people take to it immediately and they don't. Um, but, you know, everybody can work through it. It's just that they have mm-hmm. to be prepared for and have the capability for putting in the study. Sure. You know, so some of them don't have mature enough study skills. Mm-hmm. To handle it. So that's why I don't like it to be early in the curriculum. I'd rather go build up their study skills in other courses. Sure. And and I guess, and that's that's actually why, what, where my concern is, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, well, you know what, what's what is it, the state of Ohio? They're they're putting together. I mean, their course co- course title is called Digital Electronics, right? And it's you know they they talk about in the standards a lot of these these same concepts. I I just I don't think now I have a choice whether I uh, whether I use that course code or not. Sure. Um, but I just I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's if it's if it's right for my students to 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 get into this kind of depth, you know. I, yeah, because again, you know, we're we're talking about the same. You you, you said it. You know, I have kind of a captured audience. Right. They might they might this might be the first time they, um, they've ever, you know, they said, oh well, an engineering class. Let's try that. Right. Let's see. You know, let's see what's going on. Um, let's see if I can do. I could do some engineering, and these are, and they're making those decisions as um, freshmen and well, really sophomores in high school. Right. So, yeah, no, okay. So, I mean, it, it at least gives me some perspective of how I can, right, how I can approach and and. And I think it's one of the things that if you have students who are very interested in this, then you just you kind of are going to have to, you know, kind of pick and choose. Yeah, and that's right. Which is the topic. You don't you don't need to go into extreme depth because you know, they, they wanted like a four-year school. But, mm-hmm. well, I, I mean, I don't know. It, it depends what they're doing. Um, sure. You know, I mean, if you're going to go off to engineering school, I mean, if they're going to get credit for this course, mm-hmm. then it's, that, that may, be, may be tricky. I mean, you do need to cover all the material. Well, well, Ralph, I, I honestly, I don't think I could legitimately put a stamp of approval on any of my students mm-hmm. that I, I would have to go so deep right. to, to get them there to get just, a, I mean, even some of my best students, um, you know, making them, maybe having them work on their own, doing, doing a lot of extra work. Mm-hmm. I think they would still struggle. So I don't, I, I don't think I could yeah, with, probably. with all honesty, put a, put a stamp of approval that says you can, you can test out of this. Yeah, I think that might be that may be a little far fetched, but certainly you could probably do something that gives them some exposure to it. Sure. Yeah, so that when they do go off and then they take this class in college, they're like, oh yeah, I remember we had this. So some of the basics are familiar. <laughs> Those, I say, oh, that's what Mr. Jackson was talking about, that's what right? I mean. Exactly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, this makes more sense now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's um, you know, it's it's funny because when I um. Uh, you know, when I went to Ohio University, the first class that I taught was this class. It was a class mm-hmm. of seventy-five. It was a class of seventy-five students. Oh wow! In a large lecture hall, and I hadn't seen the material. You know, I, I taught that class in two thousand five. I had not seen it since nineteen eighty-six. You know, mm-hmm. that, I went into whole different. I work with lasers and optics and stuff. And so the, uh, and so I'm like, wow. I mean, I, I had to really go back, and I'm like, I, I, I didn't remember half the stuff that I'd, I'd seen. It took sure. a, lot of, a lot of review. But um, you know, now I've taught it for ten years. I mean, it's, it's, it's fine. But but it's yeah. it's, one of, it's one of these things that um, 
yeah, it's, it's a lot to go back over. And I think for anybody who's kind of teaching it at, at, at that level, um, yeah, there's there's a lot of a uh, lot of work to do. So, but um, yeah, anyway, I'm gonna keep on going here. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Yeah, I, I want I, I don't mind cutting out early either yeah, today. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm it's, it's gonna be about yeah, because I've I've got probably another you know, fifteen. That'll hours. that'll get me it. That'll get me uh, have yeah. dinner with my kids. So I don't I don't mind doing that at all. It's always a good thing. I yeah, exactly. That. So the um, there's a couple of examples I want to put on here. Um, actually, may not be. Fifteen slides, maybe just about five or six, and a couple of other things. So this is the problem, and these look. Uh, the couple examples I'm going to show are actually they, they look pretty bad. You know, you, you show a student a problem like this. I mean, they're, I think they get the deer in the headlights look, you know, and they're oh my, what in the world would I do here? Um, and it's not a. Um, the, the thing about it is, is they have to. This this forces them to really think um, in steps. You know, just like just like when they build a circuit in the lab. You know, I don't want them, you know, I give them a circuit, I don't want them to just build the entire circuit. You know, they have to actually build a small part of it, test it, build a small part, test it, and do this kind of thing. So, so yeah, it's, um, you know, so this is the same kind of situation. They kind of have to understand what's going on. So here, I'm giving them another data stream. Back. So I'm not going to go through this whole thing. I think I go through like the first row and then just, just not doing the whole thing. And so the data stream of X is coming through. And I say these 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 plots are initially preset. Okay. Uh, the um, so what ends up happening is A and B are the outputs for these two plots. Okay. So they're they're preset to one. So that's the initial, my initial state. Now the question is, what what is on the lines so that I can determine what's going to happen after the clock pulse? So I need to know what's on J A K A as the, the first flop and J B to be the second flop. Well, if you, you can write down what the equations are. You can just look look at the circuit. J is equal to, to X ended with the state of B. Okay, and K is basically a NOR gate. It's X and B prime in, in a NOR gate. So you just kind of work through these things. Then JB is just straight straight push across. Now one thing you'll notice is that J is hooked to Q from the first to second stage, and then K is hooked to Q prime. That means that the second flop, a J and K are inverse of each other, and that is a D flop. Okay, so, this, so the first one is actually a legitimate JK flop. The second one is actually a D flop because the, uh, the, the two inputs are inverted. Okay, so once you do this, you just kind of move along. You say, okay, well, I, I can see I've, I've got um, I've got B is a one going to an AND gate, X is a zero, therefore that's going to put a zero on, on JA. Okay, and then if I look at what's coming into that NOR gate, I've got X going in there, and I've also got um, B prime, uh, the second stage, that's B prime, that's a zero, so I've got a zero, zero going into a NOR, which is a one. Oh, uh, let's see, oh, actually, I, need, I didn't get that yet. Uh, let's see, J is a one because A is a one, J, second stage, that's B, that's a one, and the other one's going to be inverse zero, and then um, KA is a one. Okay, so that tells me everything I need to know, okay? Because I know the JK truth tables, I try and I tell the, I tell the students, you need to know the flop truth tables. That's part of kind of what I say in, in this class is I don't want you to memorize a whole lot of things, but there are a few things that you actually do need to memorize. You need to know all your gates, the truth table for all your gates. You need to know the state tables for your flops. You need to know your powers of two, binary numbers between zero and 15, stuff like that. So, so I've got zero, one going to the first one. That would clear it. So A star is going to go to zero. Uh, that's, that's a clear function. Um, if J, K is one, zero, that would set it to one. So therefore, B stays a one. Now I can look at what's going on with Y, okay? So Y is uh, the A star going into an X nor with B star. Okay, so that's going to come out to be, actually that's, uh, that's not clear. Let's see. Oh no, it's coming out, oh, I see, it's coming out to Q prime. No, it's coming out to Q. Okay, that's actually zero, that's not correct. The Y is not right, that's a zero. I'll fix that. Okay, then basically I have my new state of zero, one, and that's it. So, so basically, you just keep going the same process over and over. Okay. So, so basically, you just keep filling it out and, and going through it. This is this, like I said, this is uh, you know, it's, it's very similar to the other example that I worked, but it's just uh, you know, students just have to be very, you know, there's a lot of bookkeeping involved. To do methodical. That. Very methodical, and this there's some that can some students can do that and some that can't. Um, you know, another thing they can do, which a lot of, a lot of them will do, is they'll take this and put it up on multi-sim and just run it. 
you know, so you know, that's also fine to do that too. Mm -hmm. um, this is another type of um, an example that I have here, and I'm, I'm not going to run this one at all, but this is, is to give them a two-stage circuit like a D-flop and a T-flop, and basically I say, okay, look at the output of A, which is the Q of the first flop, and B, the second flop. Um, I have X, an input. Uh, I've also put a clear in there, so there's an asynchronous clear uh, in there. And I basically just say, okay, we're going to stop, and, and I'll, I'll say, okay, you know, A and B, those two flops are, are initially preset or they're initially cleared or whatever it is. And then um, the X data stream is right there, given on the, you know, given, given right there on the chart. That's your data stream. And then you have to go through and figure out, you know, what this is and put Y, you know, and figure out what Y is as a function of this. So, and, and just like the chart, you know, now you've got, and I'll say, I'll say for instance, that, you know, both of them are, are falling edge triggers. So every falling edge you go through, so everything is contained you know, on this. Uh, so students, they, they, they need to get proficiency for looking at both these um, waveform diagrams and also the regular, um, uh, just looking at some of those state charts as well. Um, so that's good. This is actually a, a problem. That's, this is something that I, I also do. And that's that I'll bring in a couple of different components. You know, something that's like a more complicated circuit. I, this is, I wouldn't put this on a test because it takes the students half an hour just to figure out what's going on. Sure. You know. But this is something I'll put in homework, uh, a problem like this, for them to really kind of figure out what it is. And it, it's not actually a, um, it, it's not a real difficult problem per se, but you just have to figure out what's, what's really going on, um, you know, and kind of just keep track of everything. Uh, you know, you've got to keep track of the fact that, you know, understand how the MUX works. You know, and you've got these inputs and, you know, you know, once the Q changes state, that's going to, the select lines are going to do something different. Also, you've got the input X, which is coming in. This is a, this is a little bit of a, I don't want to say it's a tricky problem, but it, but it takes a little bit of work. Usually, one of the things that they, they have a hard time to figure out is where to start, you know, on a problem like this. They don't really understand. And, you know, I tell them, well, you start because you know X with some data, you know, Q, the state of the flop. From that, you can get everything else. And then you just wait and see if that's going to load up the values of JK and then hit the clock, and then that sends the new Q. And you go through and redo the whole thing. This problem is not, once you understand how it works, this problem is not particularly terrible. You know, but it's a, it's a bit of an eyeful when you, when you see something like this. Likewise, something like this. Um, that's bringing in a multiplexer with a flop. This is a decoder. Okay, well, the decoders, I mean, the thing is, you know, once the students actually realize that the output of the decoders are just min terms, you know, then they can figure out exactly what's going on with J and K. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. You know, so I've got the clock driving the flop, but I've also got the clock driving the enable of the decoder. So 50% of the time, the decoder shut down. Um, so this is just a, um, another type of circuit that kind of, this is definitely moving up and could be, you know, more advanced. You know, so once they, once they realize how to the flop, they start bringing in some other components and bring it together. And this is, again, this is a homework problem. This is uh, never something I would put on test. That would just uh, be a bit rough. Um, so this is the um, flip-flops the, the, uh, for the objectives. Uh, here, I think it really, most things come into the eye, well, at least for uh, the, the classes that I've taught. Uh, you know, this, is, this works, uh, you know, we don't have a hard time achieving this level of ability. Um, one thing I don't do, which it um, talks about a little bit, are uh, propagation delay, hold time, setup times, this kind of stuff. I don't talk about this too much because um, there are, you'll, you'll actually have textbooks where they'll, they'll draw a little bitty delay in every one of these timing diagrams. I think that does a disservice because, you know, it, it makes things hard to understand. You, know, you really want the students to say, okay, when this, when this pulse goes low, it goes high because, you know, you're trying to draw the delay and that delay is, you know, it's like 20 nanoseconds. You can't even draw it on there. You know, but they, but they, you know, they, do it anyway, and I think it's uh, not worth doing. I, th I think I think we can we can talk about it and say yes, there's a little bit of a delay here because that's just the way that the circuits are. But I don't think it's helpful. So this 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 works out quite well. Um, but flip flops are um, they're pretty tricky. I mean that's that's you know it's, it's a very big part of this course. You know um, certainly longer than proportionally this this um, this piece of, of this uh, of these series of talks. It's um, 
you know, it takes the students a long time to get them, get them. And we even in the next course, which is Ditch Two, you know, we still go in and we talk about you know, the basic flop structures and everything, just to keep working. Um, I think that's it for this one. I want to show a few other things. Um, sure. A uh, couple, couple of things, a couple of files that are, that are pretty handy. And, um, I'll bring, I'll put these, I'll, I'll send these things out. I have, I have a number of files I'm going to send out. Um, Fantastic. Oh yeah. So I mean, it's like, I've got, I've got more practice problems and solutions than you know, I, I could write textbooks on this stuff. It's because I, I don't like to give the same test twice. So a lot sure. Of times, so I spend a lot of time just creating new problems all the time. So I, I just eventually just build up a very large bank of these things. Um, this is this is the document I've kind of been going through, um, you know, piece by piece for this, and it was uh, so basically here. Uh, those are counters. Those are not counters. That's Tuesday. Um, okay, look at D flop. Okay, so okay, so here's some problems. Basically, uh, this is that's a, that's an answer. okay. So basically here. Uh, kind of problems I give them. I, I'll give them things like latches. You know, basically, let, you know, solve these latch problems. And I, usually, they're just terrible latches. They're not. They don't do work hardly at all. You know, half half the states are undefined or something like this. But to go through the analysis and kind of figure out how it works. Um, this is a this is another problem. Maybe the exact same problem. I think is what I went through. You know, kind of working through this way, and then also doing the exact same thing here. So these are these two problems and how to work it through. You know, you know, working working through all these problems. This is, um, you know, very very good very good exercise. Labs. Uh, one of the things we do is we we we, we build a, a, a D latch. Okay, basically out of basic components. You know, we don't use it from a JK. We actually build it from just a basic gate. And then what I'll, what we'll do is um, we will go through, but we'll show that you can kind of um, you'll 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 basically build a gated D latch. You need two of them, and you'll build a D flip flop, and then you'll show how it works. You know, basically constructing that, you show exactly how that um, makes a flip flop, and it doesn't have any uh, transparency. You know, so I can, I can, I can, I can jiggle it up and down, and the, and the output state isn't going to hit until I hit the clock. So that that's very important to have them actually build that and see that um, in in real time. Uh, then I'll they'll have them take a 7476 JK flip flop. And wire it, wire them in toggle mode, and basically have it go through kind of a um, frequency divider, where you can go through as, as as you clock through it, it steps through, and you can see the different stages are off by a factor of two, or a factor of four, or a factor of eight, that kind of stuff. And that's a that's a uh, that's a pretty cool little, little thing to do this way. Um, that works out very well. We got aside for that document. The um, uh, Lots of lots of practice problems. I don't think this one. These don't have. Oh, these have the solutions. Okay, so yeah, these have the solutions in them. So basically, so these are this kind of Great. thing that gives. These are the kind. Of, I can. I have all kinds of stuff. So yeah. So this this is basically. I, I have students work through this, and then then I, I usually don't like to give them the solutions. I give them a, the file first, which does have solutions, because I because students will have a tendency to. Uh, to, to just read the solutions and kind of nod their head and say, okay, yeah, that looks fine. <laughs> and then they, can't solve, then they can't solve the problem when the time comes. Right. Yeah, so I, I run into that problem. So usually I'll make the solutions uh, set a different file. Yeah. And so these are the kind of problems that are very, very, much, uh, very much along the lines of the exact same things we were looking at. Here's the states. Um, there's another, another kind of crazy latch where you can see most of them are undefined. It's, you know, it's just sort of useless situation, but it's, it's good to go through because they have to go through the feedback and understand exactly how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another latch which fairly sets. Actually, this one turns out to be okay. It's not too bad. Uh, I dream these things up, and sometimes they sometimes they like they never get out of one state or something. All right, uh, then another latch configuration here, a whole bunch of undefined, um, you know, stuff like this. So this is just some example problems for them to uh, to work on. Um, um, so again, uh, this is a, this is a solution set. Here's the here's that problem actually. Okay, so here's basically looking at the solution for that that, that problem, working it out. And um, oh, those are counters there. Okay, so that's a different problem there. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, here's a here's a this is a 
this is again a um, this is a kind of a small tutorial that I wrote about the students. You know, basically here's all the flops, here's how they work. You know, just a another tutorial. I, I wish I had this graphics package back. Actually, this this this, hmm. this, uh, this picture here is very nice. This was a if, if you have a Mac, uh, there's a package called OmniGraffle, and uh, O M N I G R A F S L E, and it it has a it has a fantastic ability to draw digital circuits. Um, it's 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 very nice. I, it's, a, it's a little weird getting some of the routing. It's, these these wires are routed this way, not because I chose to do that, but because for some reason I couldn't get the wires to connect any other way. And did it, it did it for you? Yeah, I call yeah, it you draw it up there, but it's just all it's I mean, so it's, it's not really made for this. It's I think it's mostly for generally mm -hmm. flowchart software or something like that. But but it turned out it was extremely convenient for drawing circuits. You could go through and you could you could design your own gates. You could kind of you could go this double click on this and take the dot off of it or do I mean you could you could do all kinds of stuff. It was it was it was very nice. Anyway, so I, I, since I'm now on a Mac and I don't have access to it, I mean, I'm not on a PC now. But this is just a, an intro uh, you know, document for that kind of stuff. And there was one more I wanted to show, which was, uh, I think this is, uh, okay, so these are, again, more solved, more solved problems. That I give. And I, so I, I just like to give them as many of these as possible just because, um, you know, it's, it's just, you, know, you just have to kind of grind this stuff out a lot, you know, and, they, and they have to really kind of, when you do enough of this, you start really seeing, okay, nothing's going to happen until the clock kicks in, and, you know, whatever, you know, these types of things. So, so it works out pretty well. Um, yeah, I'll send a lot, I'll send these files over. Terry will upload them. Um, that's a different thing we'll talk about on Tuesday. Um, well, that'd be great. So, yeah, so all this are up. I, I, haven't, I haven't put up the ones from last time yet. The, um, it's been a, um, this month has been pretty rough, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I've, I've got my... My son's getting like college applications in, so it's been. It's been oh sure. Oh. Well, with the whole family sick, Ralph. I, that's, you know. all, that's also been true too. That's, been, that's you know, yeah. That's that's been a right. thing. Um, so that's that's really it for today. Uh, that's all. That's all I really wanted to talk about. It's because this stuff is just so so dense. Um, yeah. On, tu on, tu on Tuesday, one of the things I want, I want to talk about. I mean, I want the, the final two topics for this are um, counters and registers. And uh, okay. so I'll talk, talk a little bit about um, counters and counter chips that, that moves on to digital too, and also registers and, and how they go on for building RAM and things like this. But um, there's not a lot of that. One of the, one of the um, things it said for the CTAG was it, it, it mentions actually talking about computer architecture and stuff. Uh, that's a little bit beyond the scope of the class. Mm -hmm. uh, I only mention that in the sense that you know you build these registers up and you make. Uh, make uh, memories from that way. But I'll talk about those two, and then just I'll have several slides of kind of big sum, sum it all up and everything on Tuesday. And then okay. I'll just, now just be sure that um, all these files, you know, they're sent to Terry, so she uploads them and sends them to everybody. Mm -hmm. All right, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it for today. Um, Ralph, oh, just just real quick before we go, have you, and I, I know I keep, keep cutting out early because of uh, my other obligations, but... Yeah. I'm looking at one of my line items here, which is determine fan out and propagation delays. Not so much, actually. Okay. I haven't done that too much. That's that actually comes in more in uh, computer engineering. Okay. Well, we actually said go to a little bit higher level than this. Uh, really, when you're doing, you're starting to really do more some significant uh, circuit design. Yeah, okay. I've, I've done that before, it's, but I've, yeah, I've that's, just, yeah. Well, I've done that in the past. That's right off the standards, right? Yeah. Yeah, not so much. I mean, you you can okay. you, you can. Yeah, I've I've never talked about that in, in this class. I've done it in a second digital course, and mm -hmm. I, I've seen that in courses like VLSI design, where you're doing really laying out the real, you know, bare bones, uh, you know, all the gates for the transistors and everything, where you really you have to look mm -hmm. at all this propagation delay. Uh, but at this level, I haven't actually seen that. I think that's a little okay. optimistic. Fan out, especially sure. because I mean, you're really talking about the amount of power it takes to drive a whole bunch of other chips and something mm -hmm. like this. And that's, that's we don't really discuss that too much in, in this. Yeah, so I, I would. Say yeah, that's, no, it's, I mean, that's, some that's, of some of these aren't aren't too you know explain the purpose and use of pulsars and logic probes. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, that's you know, so so you know, usually when you when you talk blooms, you talk explain 
Right. Okay, I can, I can go over there, but determine is a little bit more. Yeah. Right. It's it it's it is. It gives you. A, but but yeah, I mean, they, in the lab they'll have they'll have exposure to you know, the pulse mm-hmm. waves. Uh, I don't think we have any logic probes except for the fact that we I, I basically tell them to take a wire and you know, hook it to the lamp and stick it in there. and You've got your logic probe. Sure. You know, but, I don't know what those are yet. So. <laughs> Oh, okay. There, well, there actually is there actually is a logic probe that you can okay. touch the circuits and it lights up or it doesn't. Whether you know, oh, okay. It's just, you know, it's it just basically says one or zero if it lights up. But it's okay. Sure. All you do is just all you do is just you know if you have like one of those trainers, one of those kits, you just put a wire with the lamp, you just stick it in there if it lights up. Okay. That's one. You know. So so I tell mm-hmm. them that I tell them that I, I have students. I encourage students to do that because you know because they don't you know they'll lay out a circuit. and I'm not sure where it's going wrong. I'm like, well, you you kind of you have to probe around and see what. So mm-hmm. what you expect, you know. And yeah, what so, your what result you're getting? Exactly, and so that's kind of a, you, know, you just take a wire and put it in a lamp. You got a cheap man's log, logic. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Yeah, it makes uh, sense. Yeah, it does. It's it's good. Yeah, I, I'm definitely. If there's anything else in there, um, you know, towards, toward, you know, next time, if there's a couple of things mm-hmm. that look, you know, that uh, you're curious about, just let me know. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. As you know, as I'm getting getting into this, I. I um, you know, I'm just trying to make sense of what these standards are, are asking for. Yeah, I haven't so. I haven't looked at those. I need to take a look at. It. I've just I've only seen them from the C tag and tag guidelines, but I haven't. Seen mm-hmm. them. Sure. And uh, I I think there's a, a fair amount of stuff that probably needs to be addressed and rewritten. You know, on the state level. And that's 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 what I've found certainly with robotics. I'm I'm, you know, I'm looking and saying, I, how can I help? <laughs> please, please let me help you. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd go up there. You know, I'll go to Columbus for a week or whatever. Exactly. I mean, you know, that's. You know, I, they probably would appreciate the help, and I, I'll, mm-hmm. talk, I'll talk to Rob about that to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I, I, I especially when you're talking about doing uh, tag guidelines. You know, basically, if I mm-hmm. if students take the course here, and they're going to get credit at Ohio State or Toledo or UC sure. or whatever. You know, you really, you really just need to be sure that all the stuff lines up, and, and uh, um, so yeah. Well, and and that's that's just it. I'm I'm looking and thinking realistically, it would be it's it's highly optimistic to get my my students this this level of content. Yeah. And to have them to have them be prepared to to well, effectively, the tag says they could skip this class. Right. Right, and that, and. That's, and that's, and even wow. If could, even if even if they could, it may not be a good idea. Yeah. You know, so it's just yeah. like I it's just like when I, I remember when I when I went into uh, uh, college and I had uh, AP credit for calculus. Sure. You know, and I was like, well, I could I could you know walk mm-hmm. in and take the take second semester calculus. And I'm like, well, that sounds like a terrible idea. I mean, I really need to so I really need mm-hmm. to you know, load up my you know my first term at college. So actually, I went through and just went ahead and took the calculus course, mm-hmm. and uh, you know it was. It was a good refresher, and, and it, mm-hmm. it allowed me to study for the other courses. But um, yeah, so to some extent, I think I think I think it's just having them get the experience and having mm-hmm. them see this stuff and where it's not too foreign, you know. Because you know, a lot of students they walk in the class and you know, they just you know they get blindsided from the start, and mm-hmm. you know, they they wouldn't have that situation, which is I think yeah, valuable. yeah, that's right. And, and and I mean that's 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 exactly right. You know, they would at least go in knowing a little bit of what to expect and. Yeah, exactly, and I think that's um, you know that that that's a good thing, and they they won't be daunted mm-hmm. you know from the start. Sure. Right. Okay. okay. Think, well, thank thank you so much, Ralph. I uh, I appreciate your uh, all, uh, you doing this these sure. days. Absolutely. Yeah, and I I hope it's uh, hope it's useful, and I'll just be sure that all the all the files and all those things get to you as well, so you can use that. Yeah. No. Fantastic. All right. Okay. Mark. Okay. Have a wonderful night. Yeah. Take care. Take care. Bye bye.